press the button. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Pashkule Calabrizi from Statistical Physics Department of CISA Trieste, Italy, in our QSTM forum. He's going to uh, give a very interesting uh, lecture on entanglement and thermodynamics in non-equilibrium quantum systems. Uh, Professor Calabrizi, we are very happy to have you in this forum. This is the 60th talk in the series, and uh, uh, you can start uh, from your end. Okay, so welcome everybody, wherever you are in the world. Uh, the title of the talk has been already said by our host. And okay, I will mainly report uh, in a very colloquium style lecture, uh, these two works that are written here. Actually the, oh, why is not moving? Ah, okay. The talk, let's say it's, uh, divided in two parts. And okay, my main goal is to explain the first part, which is which will be a very basic and colloquial style. And it's about the, and the relation between entanglement and thermodynamics after a quench in a integrable motor. This is based on this paper that I was telling before. And if you are willing to find a more pedagogical introduction, there are the 2018 Les Douche lecture notes that appeared in Cypos Physics some time ago, and you can find it. Uh, this will be very general. Then I will, there will be a second part, which uh, will be much shorter, like this part of the talk will be about one hour. This will be 15 minutes, depending on your uh, wish, uh, where I will discuss some, uh, some application of this idea to more complicated concepts and with the, uh, but, I will not enter into the details, the technical details of the computation and things that require very complicated methods, but I will just give a flavor of what can be done, okay, reporting the formula and trying to explain uh, uh, the physical results. This, uh, the original references where one can find all details are written here, and just uh, you can find uh, if you get interested into what I'm telling or you ask some question, maybe I can uh, answer or uh, you can just have a look to the original reference. So let's move to our problem. What we have in mind is to study isolated system, quantum system out of equilibrium. And the idea that we have in mind is the one of a quantum quench, which means we prepare a many body quantum system, which can be, for example, a quantum field theory or a real gas in an experiment, whatever, in a given pure state that we call psi naught, which is not an against state of the Hamiltonian that govern the evolution. Then from some time, let's say t equal to zero, we let it evolve according to the quantum mechanical rule. So there is, the system is isolated. There is no environment, no but nothing. And the, state remains pure at any time, and it's given by the Schrodinger equation as written here, okay, as we learn in quantum mechanics. The question that have been asked about this system, uh, these protocols are uh, very basic, uh, starts from very basic one, how we can describe these dynamics, how we can extract information from the time dependent state. Does it exist a stationary state, okay? In which sense exists a stationary state? Can it be thermal, for example? One should be very careful in, in saying why, why and how this state can be thermal because the time dependent state here, Psi T, is a pure state. It has strictly zero entropy. And so at any time T, while the thermal mixed state corresponding to the same energy of this state as non-zero energy is mixed and has non-zero entropy. So the system it, as a, a whole cannot relax to a thermal state, but as we know, we expect thermalization in some sense. So we, I will try to make clear what I mean, uh, how this can be possible. But before I want to show one experiment that where uh, some key feature of these dynamics uh, were uh, seen, okay, this is an experiment of 2006 from Penn State University by the, in the group of the device. And nowadays there are tons of experiments of this kind, but 
this is really one experiment that set the stage and that's why I'm, I want to show it. it. So in this experiment, a few hundred atoms of rubidium were loaded in an optical trap and they formed a, a quasi condensate in 1D or a condensate in higher dimension. And uh, okay, at time t equal to zero, what they did is they sh shine some last laser on this uh, cloud of atoms, which uh, create two counterpropagating clouds, which move, which are more or less equal and moves in opposite direction, uh, in opposite direction of the potential. Uh, and what they do, they climb this potential until they reach a, a point uh, where the old kinetic energy is changing to potential energy and so uh, uh, they stop and then they come back exactly like classical ball will be will do if they are put here and that's uh, what a, a neutron a classical neutron cradle is what happens now is that when they meet in the center they interact because these atoms are interacting atoms are not free are strongly interacting object and then they depart in the opposite direction always conserving uh, energy and momentum uh, okay, so this is a sketch of what is going on here on the right of the slide. You can see the uh, the data of the real experiment of what is happening for uh, about one period. And you see that during this period, there is uh, no loss of information and the, the, the observed dy dynamic is basically unitary. Okay, so this is the kind of experiment that these people at Penn State did. What, let's see what they find out of this experiment. What they found is that in two and three dimension, the system relaxes quickly and thermalizes. Here you see some plot of the momentum distribution function in 2D, for example, you see that initial time, they are, there are two peaks here that correspond to the uh, two counterpropagating clouds that are here with very well-defined momentum. Then after few interaction here, uh, for example, uh, uh, they showed data for, uh, two period, four period and nine period. Uh, the system, uh, the momentum distribution function of this system has a Gaussian shape, which is uh, characteristic of a thermal distribution. Okay, so you see how the in initial uh, memory of the fact that uh, there were- um, Sir? Yes? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I was just uh, confused about what do you mean by a thermal distribution over here? Do you mean a Maxwellian distribution? Yes, basically, yes. Okay, 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 sure. For the momentum distribution is the quant the system is at high energy to be Maxwell, but okay, eventually the, the quantum version, if the energy is not too much. Uh, what instead I want to point out is that in one dimension, the system relaxes very slowly in time to a non-thermal distribution. We see here that for some value of the interaction strength that in, uh, in the units that are standard, but okay, you don't have to know what this means, but in some dimensionless unit equal to 18 in this case and 3.2 here, so some quite uh, large interaction, not small at all. One need a lot of oscillation, not nine, like here it's about 400, here it's about 2000, to observe distribution that are stationary, but are not Gaussian at all. You see that here there are secondary peaks in this momentum distribution function, which are a memory of the initial state that, had in, that initially were just two delta function, almost delta function, very close to this value here. Okay, so uh, here we learn two things from this experiment. First of all, that in some circumstances, some observable have the same values as if the entire system was in a thermal ensemble. Okay, so as made explicit by this momentum distribution function here. Instead, in some other situation, which I will explain in a second uh, where, where what is the origin, we don't, reach uh, thermal ensemble, but we reach different kind of uh, stationary ensemble, uh, which um, were not, were never observed before, and we can safely call them uh, non-equilibrium new states of matter, 
with very unconventional features, like in a thermal ensemble, you will never see these secondary peaks. All the, everything will be smoother than the Gaussian as here. Okay, so what is uh, going on? To understand what is going on, we have to uh, understand what is the connection between entanglement and thermodynamics. Okay, so we take... Um, so can I just ask a very short question? So um, yeah. initially, uh, did I understand you correctly that you have to start necessarily from an unentangled product state? Absolutely not. Oh, okay, so, so just a pure state. Pure state, no, actually, it, I'm saying pure state just to make an easy case. The state can be even mixed in that mm -hmm. with the pure state, the paradox that the entropy starts from zero and should end non-zero, it's more clear. If the state would be mixed from the beginning, uh, obviously the initial uh, entropy is non-zero, so the fact that it's non-zero at the end will not be such a surprise, maybe. Uh, but, uh, but okay, so uh, the, the pure state is not even a requirement, it's just to make clear what is going on. But obviously the initial state can have some degree of mixedness and this is completely compatible with everything I'm, I'm, I said and I will go on, I'm going to say the real pure state don't exist in, uh, in the labs, but uh, all these things are done uh, nowadays routinely. It's, this is one of the experiments of many years ago, but nowadays there are few experimental months going out showing some aspect of this uh, uh, quench dynamics. Did I answer in a satisfactory way? Uh, yes, yeah, so, and uh, you, you uh, always mean entanglement entropy, or then do you also differentiate between thermal entropy or, or ent uh, entanglement entropy? Or I didn't uh, enter uh, yet in this. <laughs> yes, anyhow, I for the moment I in this talk I will just discuss entanglement entropy. Okay, thank you. As I will soon see. So. Mm. So what is the connection between this and the entanglement entropy and the thermodynamics? Let's us take our favorite system here that we consider infinite for reasons that will be clear soon. And in this infinite system, we have the time dependent pure state. Now we can focus our attention on a final subsystem that we call A. So any reminder of the system is called B. And our, uh, 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 our Feynman subsystem can be characterized by the reduced density matrix, which is defined as the trace over the degrees of freedom of the reminder B of the system of the density matrix of the entire system, which is just the projector on the state side. Of it. Now, what usually happens is that rho A of t correspond, it's a, it's a mixed state, even if the original state was pure in most genetic circumstances. And the entanglement entropy, which is defined as the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix, measure the bipartite entanglement that there is between A and B, meaning the degree of quantum correlation between these two parts. Okay? Now, I will not try to tell you why and how the entanglement measure, uh, the, this quantity measures the entanglement, just we take it as a, a fact and we continue. Now, an important observation, which is trivial, but it is maybe was overlooked for a while, is that the expectation values of all local observable within A are just, just require the knowledge of the reduced asymmetric row A of t, in the sense that the expectation value of an operator OA, which is local within A, which means that all the points that define it are within A, uh, the expectation value of this operator on the time dependent state is clearly equal to the trace over the reduced density uh, of the reduced density matrix times the uh, operator OA. So, uh, uh, to determine in a local or uh, a local operator, we don't need to know what is happening to the system down here, but we just need to know the reduced symmetric inside. It. Now, my definition of stationary state is the following: a stationary state exists for the entire system if 
any finite subsystem A of the entire of this uh, infinite subsystem admit an infinite time limit for the reduced density matrix, which I will call rho A infinity. Okay, so we take this A to be finite. This is the only requirement, but can be everywhere inside the system and can have arbitrary dimension. It's not so the, uh, uh, the exist means you want to mean finite. No, no, this limit, ex if this limit exists. Oh, a li limit exists, okay, okay, okay. If this limit exists, and it's well, as a matrix, okay, uh, then I will say that the, sy the system reached a stationary state. Obviously, this is very different from saying that um, uh, the state psi t reached a, sta a stationary value, which likely is in, uh, which very probably is impossible, okay? It, it, there will be always things very far away that will continue moving, but as long as we are inside a finite subsystem, this will not happen and the reduced density matrix will uh, reach a stationary value as we will see explicit examples soon. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, um, so this assumption of stationary uh, state uh, uh, could you please make? Uh, could you please say a little bit loud because your background noise is coming. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Is it better now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, like, because you're saying that uh, for any finite subsystem, so I can imagine taking a subsystem which is as small as possible. Yes. Right. And so then. I mean, it just seems to me that this limit would imply that uh, your state would be a product state. Is that? Absolutely not. I'm talking about. No? Okay. I, I don't see the, the reason. What what do you mean? No, because you would have a density matrix. Um, the dense the reduced density matrix is not the, the total density matrix is not the product of the reduced density matrix. Eh? Right. Mm -hmm. Else, else, the, this is the definition of pure state of a product state, but no, mm -hmm. is, else there will be no entanglement. Okay, is mm -hmm. okay, all, all right, all right. Uh, thanks. Uh, my mistake, but please ask question now if something is non clear because okay, better to clarify what the formula means than going on and not understanding what I'm saying. So, uh, what in this language means that a system thermalized? Now, let's consider the Gibbs ensemble for the entire system, okay? Not for the subsystem. The Gibbs ensemble, as you well know, is just uh, e to the minus h divided by t with some normalization. And, uh, okay? We, um, then, since in this protocol, of the quantum quench, the energy is conserved. The expectation value of the, Amil, uh, of the Hamiltonian in the initial state should be equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the thermal state. Okay, so this equation fixes the, the temperature that should appear here. Okay, so the temperature of uh, to which the system is relaxing is not a free parameter that we can fit to fix some uh, experimental data or some numerical data, but it's just fixed by the value of the energy in the initial state by this equation here, okay? I hope this is clear. So in this game, there is no free parameter. We, the system we, uh, can relax to a, therma, to a thermal ensemble in which temperature is fixed by the energy of the initial state. Now, from this thermal ensemble, which has non-zero entropy, okay, so the thermal ensemble has non-zero entropy. We can take the, the reduced density matrix for a subsystem A, defined exactly like before, okay, as the reduced density matrix as the trace over the degrees of freedom of B of the total density matrix. Now I will say that the system thermalizes if for any final subsystem A, these two reduced density matrix are the same. So the one that we obtain for infinite time and the thermal one at the, with the temperature given by the energy in the initial state, okay? 
Is it clear? So in jargon, often we say that uh, the system acts as its own map. If you have questions, so, about it. so this statement actually corresponds to that for a very long time, if you wait, then uh, the system actually thermalizes. Is, is it so? Like, yes, but yeah, any finite subsystem thermalizes, and the time scale for the subsystem to thermalize, yeah, will depend on the dimension of the subsystem. And then we the fact that the system is always in a pure state and is never thermal, you will see in the fact in. The, the other side of this medal will be that there will be at any fixed time there will be always a subsystem big enough that is not thermal. But we have to take the opposite way of thinking. I fix the subsystem and I wait enough time for that subsystem to relax. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so this is the right logic. Because if I take the opposite uh, way of thinking, no system will ever thermalize. At any fixed yeah. time, there will be always a large enough subsystem that is not thermal. But this is not where we want to go, not where we should go, actually. Having said this, now, this is, thermization is expected in general for systems that are chaotic in the sense that they have uh, no other internal motion except the Hamiltonian, but there are many integrable systems, and likely the one that was shown here is one of them that explains this anomalous behavior that we see. What happened to this uh, integrable system? What was proposed by Rigol et al. back in 2007, it's many years ago now, that this integrable system actually relaxed to something that has been called generalized Gibbs ensemble which is just a Gibbs distribution in which the one not only take into account the conservation of the energy, but of all the integral of motion. The integral of motion are denoted by IM here, and usually in an integral system are infinite. There's an infinite set of them. And they are characterized by the fact that they commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay, and, but then in this generalized Gibbs ensemble, you will see the appearance of uh, this Lagrange multiplier lambda m, one could wonder, but there are too many parameters in this game, all this lambda m. Actually, there is no parameter at all because each of these parameters is fixed by the requirement that the integral of motion assume all of them, assume the same value in the initial state and um, in the asymptotic generalized Gibbs ensemble. So these are a given set of equations for uh, the same number of uh, unknown lambda m. And one, it's not, in some cases, it's easy to solve them for interacting model, it's a bit more complicated and require techniques that are uh, far beyond the goal of this lecture. But it's clear that the number of equation is equal to number of unknown. So there is no three parameter in this game. Now the system relaxes to the generalized Gibbs ensemble exactly under the same condition as before, which means we take a finite subsystem. If the reduced density matrix of the generalized Gibbs ensemble is equal to the reduced density matrix of uh, the system at infinite time, then the system uh, thermalizes. But, okay, this is very similar to what uh, happen in classical system, even for a few degrees of freedom, not only in a many body one, but this is the, now we come the first surprise of quantum mechanics that the concept of integral of motion uh, is not so trivial as in uh, classical mechanics. It's not just something that commute with a method. In fact, uh, yes. Uh, so is, is it, uh like saying that basically there is a different temperature parameter for each integrable quantity. If you so want to call the, temperature, yes, okay. It's, it's like, like a generalized temperature. If you want to call temperature, yes, it's okay. Just, okay, in my mind, the temperature is something connected to the fact that we are cold or, uh, or warm. Uh, and this is connected with the energy, okay? Like the, mm -hmm. the momentum, I would not call a temperature something 
to make a simple example, or the angular momentum, why I should call temperature something connected to, with the angular momentum. Mm -hmm. But okay, yes, in a, if you wish, there is a different temperature for any mm -hmm. interlock motion. Okay. The, the word temperature probably is, uh, right. uh, it's not the most appropriate one, but okay, fine. It, it's okay. just names. There is a Lagrange multiplier for each uh, to be fixed. Sure. Exactly like in the, in the canonical ensemble, you have uh, the temperature, which is Lagrange multiplier connected with the Hamiltonian. For example, in the grand canonical ensemble, you have both the temperature and the chemical potential, and the chemical potential is, I don't know, the Lagrange multiplier oh. connected with the number, which is a conserved quantity. Now, if you, right. if you wish to call the chemical potential temperature, I'm completely okay with it. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I see. one clarifies what the word means. Right, right, right. It's okay. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, the, but the question which is non trivial and that I think was really overlooked in ages of uh, study of non equilibrium dynamic of quantum system, which is the crucial difference with classical mechanics, is what integral of motion should be put in this GG? Any quantum system has too many integral of motion. For example, if we take the operator, which is the projector on the eigenstate, this by definition commute with the Hamiltonian, okay? But these objects are really too many. They are exponentially large with the, uh, they, they have the same dimension as the Hilbert pace, so they are exponentially large with the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, take for example a system of fermion, which are uh, which have two possibility per site, uh, uh, per particle per site, call as you want. If we have n fermion, we have two to the n of this object, of two to the n against state and two to the n projector. Okay, while the degrees of freedom are just n, and in classical mechanics one would say that the system is integrable if it has n uh, integral motion, not two to the n. But not only, this object exists for any model, even the non-integrable one. So if we should take into account this object, no system will ever set malides going against common wisdom and experimental fact. Okay, so there are some integral of motion that should be put in the GG because they are special in a sense that I will say soon. And there are some other like this one that should not be included in the GG. What is the difference? Okay, explaining why in formula is a bit too technical, but the physics is very clear. In this generalized Gibbs ensemble, one should put only what is called local or quasi-local integral of motion. Okay, for example, a local integral of motion is an integral which is the, uh, is an, an integral of motion which is a sum or an integral in the case of continuous space of local operator. Okay, so are exactly the same kind of charges that enter in nether theorem of quantum field theory is the same kind of object. Okay, and not only these objects have the right locality property to be put up here. Why? Because objects like this one are non-local. So they will connect a finite subsystem A in which we are interested with something that is on, on Alpha Centauri and clearly has uh, no, uh, meaning for what we are saying. And one expects that in the thermodynamic limit, uh, the contribution of objects like that to a generalized Gibbs ensemble will just uh, go away because they are too, uh, too sparse in the system, okay? And they are not, uh, uh, they have no influence on, the fi on a finite subsystem, okay? So this fact can be proved for a class of integrable model Okay, the one with the simple better answers to be clear. So it's, it has been proved, but uh, okay. For the aim of this lecture is just, you can just trust me that the reason for this assumption is quite obvious. I, I hope it's clear to everyone and we will just continue with this, uh, with this hypothesis. Okay, uh, so do I have questions till now? Um, it's not a question, but uh, uh, right. So just just a, just a comment. 
yes uh this this uh, ob observation that you are making that um this conserved conserved quantity should correspond to local integrals local operators yeah uh this this happens to coincide with uh, the definition that is given by uh, harlow and oguri uh, in their work on um why why um, there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity uh so so you know in in a, in a in a different context you know the the same sort of definition has been given uh no but it's not surprising to me okay and a quantum right. theory by definition is locality is the central point okay so yeah. right these things happen in many the importance of local internal motion was first realized by neither so it's not some uh Uh, big news okay what i'm telling is that for the large time uh, limit of uh, this non equilibrium quantum system was overlooked for many years okay in spite of the fact that it's quite natural as you are saying it appears in gravity it appears i'm sure it appears in so many other places that uh, yeah. i cannot even think all of that yes. but yes thank you for the comment there was another question also Okay, if not, I just continue. So now that we set the stage of what we are talking, so all these are just definition. I didn't, uh, um, as you see, I didn't perform any calculation yet. I just gave you um, my understanding, if you want to create the current understanding of uh, what thermization and equilibration to a statistical ensemble means. Now, where the connection with uh, between entanglement thermodynamics comes from it's very easy and here it is it just doesn't require any calculation even this so the fact that uh, the two reduced density matrix the thermodynamic one td stands for thermodynamic and can be either gibbs or gg is uh, not essential for these uh, uh, properties so the fact that thermodynamic reduced density matrix is equal to the infinite time one, okay, which is our definition of uh, stationarity, implies also that some system entropy are the same. That's obvious. This is a functional of this object. So the thermodynamic entropy of the subsystem is equal to the uh, entanglement entropy at infinite time. But the thermodynamic entropy of the uh, thermodynamic entropy defined in the entire system is extensive. So as long as this volume of the subsystem is, uh, is, as long as the subsystem is large enough in the sense that this volume is uh, big enough, the, 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 the density of thermodynamic entropy, which means the thermodynamic entropy divided by the volume of the entire system is approximately equal in the sense, apart from boundary term, to the uh, thermodynamic entropy of the subsystem divided by its own volume. Okay, this is just definition, the basic principle of thermodynamics that the entropy is extensive. Okay, yeah. and but we have that the second part is also equal to the entanglement and the entropy density. So what we find by this chain of equation, which is which are just trivial, okay, just follow from the definition we gave of being a stationary ensemble, we have that. For large time, the entanglement entropy become the thermodynamic entropy, okay? So while this object come from taking the trace of a pure state with exactly zero entropy, this other object here comes from taking the trace of an object already with some entropy, okay? So the two object comes from very different beasts, but they are the same in the end, okay? And this explain if you want that the entropy of the stationary state is just the entanglement that has been accumulated during time by any large subsystem, okay? I hope this is clear because it's, uh, it's mainly word, the equations are just very easy. If you have some comment on these. 
So th this would be uh, independent on the subsystem size or for any subsystem? Uh, no, no, this, no, no, no. Here, for this equality to be true, you need a large subsystem. So the entropy, what I'm saying is that the thermodynamic, the entanglement entropy of a large subsystem is equal to, for instance, time is equal to the thermodynamic entropy, which is far from trivial, okay? Usually entanglement and thermodynamics are seen as very disconnected objects and actually that are even in contrast to one to the other, that they fight each other. Instead here we are saying that as long as the subsystem is large enough, okay, how much larger will depend on the system, on the run of the system and those many things, the entanglement entropy at infinite time has the same density as the thermodynamic entropy. For a small subsystem, this is not, this, this, uh, this breaks down obviously, but mainly because this equation here is not valid, okay? The boundary term will be as big as the volume term, so you cannot uh, uh, say, argue that these two guys are equal. Okay, if there are no other questions, I will continue. I'm sorry. Yes. It's no, not clear. No. It's not, I mean, it's not obvious to me because like when I think about a subsystem, I mean, uh, you know, it, it could have a subsystem, all of its degrees of freedom need not necessarily be entangled with, with the larger system, right? Uh, there could be degrees of freedom which are independent, right? Which, which remain un, un, unentangled. And those degrees of freedom would have their, their own uh, thermal entropy. So, uh, so you know, it, it's not the clear to me that- system, The entire system is always pure, yeah. So there is no other, for the total system here, for this guy here, okay? The system is pure. So mm. there is no other thing as entanglement entropy. There is no thermal stuff around. If there is an entropy, is some connection with the outside of A. Okay, I see. Okay. This, is, this is true for any pure system. It's not, it's nothing to do with the quench now, okay? Even when this second part here is not valid, like for the ground state or in, okay, uh, for, for, the, for the ground state, maybe you heard something about the entanglement entropy of the ground state, which is the area law and all these kind of stories. All this equation here, this part of the equation are not valid, but the entropy of this pure state is entirely a connection with the other part of the system. It's a pure state, there is no, uh, no other thermal or mixedness except the, the entanglement. Which is the reason why the entropy for a pure state is a measure of entanglement. Right, so, so this, uh, this, this would be a measure of entanglement in a mixed state, but yeah. we are in a pure state. Right, thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, so since this is a very crucial point, if you have any question, just... Uh... Okay, I just continue then. As I was telling, so all these are just definition. We didn't make any calculation yet. It's a nice theoretical idea. It has anything to do with the real world, okay? Now, instead of presenting many simulations that show that this is the case, the nicest thing is to show actually a real experiment done in the group of Marcus Greiner at Harvard in 2016, where the, the title by itself explained what I'm saying. The title of the paper was Quantum Thermization Through Entanglement in an Isolated Many Body System, which is exactly what I've been talking about. And what they did is with some small variation to the experiment, exactly what I've been telling. They prepare a state in a, some low entangled state that is here, it's a pure state. So by, uh, it has only small entanglement, which is represented by this connection here. Then as the time pass and the system evolve, there are many connections between its part and any subsystem which is represented here, looks like thermal. Okay, as they made in this very nice uh, 
uh, cartoon, they explain probably in a much nicer uh, cartoon way with respect to what I've been telling, but I'm not able to make this nice plot. So. Uh, this is only a cartoon here and instead of the, uh, the real experimental data. Now I'm not entering into details how these people managed to measure uh, the entanglement entropy. Actually, they it's not possible to measure the real von Neumann entropy. What one should measure is the, the so-called second Rene entropy. But okay, the, the amount, the kind of information that is inside is very similar, and I will not make much uh, uh, difference between the two. Okay, uh, but what we learn from this discussion till now, okay, before starting making calculation here. First of all. I think that from the very philosophical point of view, these ideas are a paradigm shift about the origin of entropy, okay? Thinking that the entropy is nothing but the entanglement, it's really a, a different way about thinking about the entropy. Then, from the more practical point of view, we can also say that understanding the quenched dynamic I'm talking cannot proceed from the understanding of the entanglement entropy, okay? Because the entanglement is the, the key feature that leads to thermalization in a very neat way compared to other observable, which instead of mix many effects that are different, the entanglement, as we saw already, just is directly related to, to the relaxation and thermalization. And we will see even how clean is this behavior. And now my question, that what I want to answer in the in this talk is what is the entanglement entropy after a quench in a generic integrable model, okay? So in, a, in any integrable model. And that's what I will try to answer from here. So if you have questions before moving uh, to the answer to this question. Okay, if not, Let's move to the basic idea to understand uh, the entanglement evolution in these integrable models, which is an idea that goes under the name of light cone spreading of entanglement entropy, which was uh, proposed by myself and John Carney 15 years ago. And okay, at that time we proposed this idea as a mechanism. I must say that the, the quantitative power of this uh, idea that we proposed long ago was understood slowly during the years, okay? And uh, more than a, a mechanism is really what is going on as we will see soon. So after a quench, this initial state psi zero act as a source of quasi-particle excitation of pairs of quasi-particle excitation at time t equal to zero, okay? A particle of momentum P as energy EP and the velocity is just the derivative of the energy with respect to the momentum. Okay, why we take pairs of quasi particle? It's uh, an assumption which uh, actually uh, it turned out later that is the only configuration that is compatible with integrability. Actually, okay, so. Only when the initial state produces pairs of quasi-particle, the following dynamic is integrable. But okay, even this is something uh, uh, that is not important for this talk. For the moment, these pairs uh, you can take as an hypothesis as we did back in 2005, okay? And you can think of uh, generalizing to different situations as it has been done, by the way. Now, for larger time after being produced, this quasi-particle just moves semi-classically with velocity VP. Now, the point, the idea is that any point in the system emits quasi-particle as it happened here. Now there is no entanglement or correlation between particle emitted at different point, like here, okay? While particle emitted from the same point or more precisely, from region of the size of the initial correlation length are entangled. But okay, so let's assume that there is a, a very small correlation length, or even if it's large for, uh, as the time, there will be always a time such that this correlation length doesn't matter. 
So let's, for all practical purposes, this collision length can be zero, okay? So only particles emitted from the same point are entangled. And what they do is that as the time pass, this particle move farther away and they bring the entanglement to farther away region, okay? Since they move ballistically at time t, the, the, the entangled region will be a region of at distance qvt here. This plot is for the case of v equal one, like is uh, in field theory usually. But uh, okay, in general, the, the length of the entangled region will be qvt. Actually, each point x prime, which belongs to A, is entangled to a point x second in B if there is a pair of quasi-particles uh, which connects them, okay? And this can be true only if x second plus or minus VPT is equal to x prime minus plus VPT, okay? So if these two points here are entangled because there are a pair of quasi-particles that connect them, but these two points here are too far away at this time to be connected by a pair of quasi particles. Now, the entanglement entropy of the interval A that is here is proportional to total number of pairs of particles that emitted from an arbitrary point, one reach A and the other reach the subsystem B. Now, this is the crucial formula for this talk and actually the, uh, probably the only important formula of this talk, okay? If we denote by FP the rate of production of pairs of quasi-particle momentum plus or minus P and their contribution to the entanglement entropy also, okay? This implies that the entanglement entropy at given time T of the region A is given by this formula. Let's see why. Particles are emitted with the arbitrary momentum P, okay, we integrate over all momentum with this rate F of P, okay? And they are emitted from many point X here. So any point means in one dimension from between minus infinity and plus infinity. After being emitted, this particle will move ballistically and the classical trajectory of the quasi-particle is enforced by this two delta function one particle moves to the right, so its position will be x plus VPT, and the other particle moves to the left, and its position will be x minus VPT, okay? So these are just constrained to enforce the classical trajectory. And then I require that one particle here is in A, and the other particle x second is in B, okay? So it's clear this equation. Please ask now, because this is the only important equation of the So, so uh, why are there three uh, spatial integrals? Is it x is where the particle is produced. X prime and x second is where the particle arrive. One particle arriving. There are two particles produced at the same point x. Okay, and from this point, one move to the left and arrive to x prime, and the other move to the right and arrive to x second. And I require, since I'm interested in the line between a and b that one x, that x prime belong to A and x second belong to B. Okay, I see. So one is where the particle is emitted, and then I make two further integration just to enforce, to, to count only the particle that are where I want, okay? This particle will always exist. <laughs> Obviously they don't die, but I require that this particle are one in A and one in B. I don't count particles that are both in B or both in A. Uh, <clears throat> am I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, this is fine, but uh, like, I don't uh, understand why that initial statement you made that uh, when, you, when you perform a quench, the quasi particles will be generated. Uh, that, that, that uh, I don't, I don't, uh, can, can you elaborate on why quasi-particles are generated after a quench? Uh, you won't, okay, from the, from the technical point of view, okay, 
let's try to make, okay, uh, let's give two different answers, which are equivalent. One is mathematical, one is physical. Uh, the point is that the mathematical one is often easily, easily uh, understood in an easier way, which is the following. The initial state is not an eigenstate, so it's a superposition of eigenstate of the theory. Okay. The, are you following me? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. It's just that, that there is a lot, lot of the superposition in the quasi-particle uh, uh, language means that it's a superposition of part of uh, the excitation are the quasi-particle of the system. So the system is sum of quasi-particle while in pairs because the initial state has zero momentum. So the easiest way to satisfy the zero momentum condition is to just take particle with momentum p and minus p. Okay. Uh, this is why it was paired. Actually, you can have more complicated situation in principle. And as I said, it has been shown that for interacting integrable model, you cannot, but this is a technical way. For the moment, let's, uh, let's say these pairs of quasi particles surely are there and we take into account only them. Okay, and let's see what happens. And actually uh, the point, the final point is that the other one will not uh, appear at all. Uh, then, but from the physical point of view, if you are not satisfied with this, okay. Also, it's like when, uh, when in quantum field theory, there is pair production. Okay, it's, it's the very same philosophy, okay? From the vacuum, there is spontaneous emission and you have to produce an electron and a positron for conservation in that case of uh, not only of the momentum, but of the, uh, also of the charge. And why there is that? Because there is a fluctuation of the energy that passed the threshold of the production of the pair. And so you can produce this pair of uh, particles, okay? So it's exactly the same thing. You can take uh, each of the two explanations, they are the same, okay? Just one is more from a physical language, the other is very mathematical, you just write the equation, the initial state is a superposition of particles, uh, which is the same reason why the... So it's a basically final because... State is, a, is a superposition of a pair of particles, even in field theory, and that's why you have electron positron creation or mm -hmm. similar things, yes? So it's basically because like after the quench, the system is left in a non-equilibrium state. Yes, after the quench, the system is in a non-equilibrium state. And, and so because of that, there will be regions where uh, the energy fluctuation is larger than that required to create quasi-particles. No, no, there will be in all the region. It, it's, an I, it's a state with a lot of energy. It's like, Okay. okay, the quench is a big bang. Uh, now I don't want to exaggerate, but okay, the quench is really like a big huh. bang. A lot of energy, okay. and what the system can do, makes particles. Okay, that's I the see. only thing that is inside okay. the system. Okay, all right, thanks. Quench, actually there was this uh, way of describing a quench by Boris Altschule that say, take a quantum system and take, put it with a number, okay, if you give a number <laughs> to a quantum system, then obviously you give a lot of energy and okay, that's, so all this quasi-particle will move away. All right, thank you. And, and for these quasi-particles, uh, do you have to uh, assume something on the, on the lifetime of uh, this so that these can uh, Very good question. Here I'm talking about uh, an integrable model, which one of the definition of integrable model is that the lifetime is infinite. Okay, so for what I'm talking, the lifetime is infinite. What happened, how to modify this when the lifetime is not infinite, it's finite. Okay, there are many, many aspects that have been taken in uh, account in the literature, like the idea of pretermization and many other similar stories, but this is far beyond the goal of this talk. But one can, saying if the, this quasi-particles are long-lived, what will happen, how we move from a GG to a thermal ensemble, for example. Okay, this kind of question has been asked. Okay, thanks. But this is far more complicated than this formula that is written here. So, I'm not, so this is, 
do you have other question about this first line of the equation? Okay, if not, I continue. Now for the case, this formula is valid for an arbitrary B partition in A and B, okay? Uh, actually it's valid even if it's not a B partition, just A and B are uh, some different part of the system. But now we want to specialize to the case in which the subsystem A is an interval of length L, okay? And the subsystem B is the remainder of the system. In that case, we should just integrate the delta function. It's quite easy, but I don't want to make integral over at all. Even the integral of delta function gives some theta function. Just trust me that this is the, the final result that appear, okay? Which is, you can easily convince by, uh, staring at this formula for a few minutes, even less. Now, what is the important thing of this equation, okay? The uh, one important aspect is that for short time, as long as the velocity is bound, only this guy contribute to the entanglement entropy and, the, and this entanglement entropy grows linearly in time. Why is that? If the entanglement, if the velocity is bound as some d max, like it happened, for example, in a quantum field theory, in which the, uh, the maximum value of the entanglement entropy of the velocity, sorry, is the speed of the light, or it happened in lattice model because of something that is called Lee Robinson bound. So for many reasons, the velocity can be bound. When the velocity is bound, what happened is that if the time is such that it's two v max times the time is shorter, than, is smaller than L, then the argument of this theta function that appear here and here are always, this is always one and this is always zero, okay? Because there is no velocity that is larger than V max. Then this integral is just doesn't depend on the time anymore. And we just have that the entanglement entropy grows linear in time T with the slope, which is just the integral of this guy with one replacing the theta function. Okay. Is it clear why this happened? In the opposite limit, by the way, for very large time, what happened is that this theta function is always zero, okay, because for very large time, uh, L uh, will always be smaller than QVPT. So this opposite is zero. This theta function here is always one, and the entanglement entropy is extensive and its density is given by the integral of this f of p. Okay, so these are the two limits. But let's see some plots of entanglement entropy. So what we predict is that the entanglement entropy first grows linearly and then slowly reach some extensive value. When we proposed this idea back in 2005, we were not even sure that this was the, the case that our idea were correct. Okay, it was really long time ago. Uh, what we did, we perform some explicit quench for uh, a spin chain that is called transverse free diving chain. I don't write even the Hamiltonian, doesn't matter. Okay, for this spin chain, we plot the entanglement entropy as function of time, and we see exactly what we predicted there, that it grows linearly and then it saturates something that is proportional to the subsystem size. And here we see this thing for many different quenches saying many different initial state and many different final Hamiltonian with different, uh, all these curves here correspond to different final Hamiltonian and each plot correspond to different initial state. So you see that in all the cases with for the quench within the transverse field in chain, we have this behavior, linear increase followed by saturation to some extensive value. Actually, a few years later with my student at that time, Maurizio Fagotti, we managed to prove this formula for transverse field and chain in which we were able to know exactly what is the value of this source function here, that here in the quasi-particle picture is just a conjecture with an explicit calculation in transverse field and chain, which was quite difficult and cumbersome. We managed to calculate this source function and it's given by the formula here. It's written here, okay? It's not, uh, don't, uh, it's given in this way. Yeah. So it's something quite complicated that could not be guessed, but should be, uh, was calculated by me. 
uh, at that time. Okay, and I'm reporting this formula because later we will explain uh, this formula by quasi particle picture. Okay, so we saw the main prediction of quasi particle picture is that the entanglement entropy grows linearly and it follows after the horizon, okay, or when we go out of the light cone, it starts. Uh, um, it bends to reach an asymptotic value, which is uh, uh, extensive. There is not a sharp light cone because in these models, there is a dispersion relation of VP. The velocity depends on the momentum. There is not just one velocity, like is the case in conformal field theory that many of you may know. By the way, even in quantum field theory, you can have a dispersion because if the theory is massive, the various quasi particle will have different velocity. Okay. Uh, yes. What are the parameters in this uh, expression, this phi? phi? Okay, the phi is the momentum, basically. Okay, it's just, uh, I copied from my old paper and there I was indicating phi. Uh, so phi is the momentum of which I integrate, it's the same as mm -hmm. here, this p. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the same. So this okay. formula is the same as this one here. Just right. the only difference is that we know what is S for P, which here I call H, of course, delta phi, and it's written here. And the parameters that appear here, H and H naught, are two parameters that identify the initial state and the Hamiltonian governing the evolution. Okay, thanks. Okay, but the, these are fair questions, but the main message is that we observed in this model uh, this behavior predicted by quasi particle. Okay, and this is just okay. We proposed this picture and we found this since 2005 to nowadays. There it was plenty of uh, numerical simulation, experiment, everything that showed that actually this behavior is extremely general and generic. It happened every time. Okay, even when actually even when the quasi particle are not there. And to break this behavior, you really need to make something bad to the system, like in many body localized system or when there is confinement of quasi particle, only these kinds of mechanisms can be this very general uh, mechanism. In fact, even in the experiments, this is the experiment I was telling before of 2016 in Harvard, even in this experiment, we see some traces Okay, they have a very small system of a system of six boson, uh, of six lattice sites of boson. And um, so the subsystem were just of one, two, and three spins. But what they observe also is the uh, growing, uh, more or less linear growing of the subsystem, followed by saturation with some effect, uh, which, are, which are called revival nowadays, that are due to the, fine, uh, to the fact that the subsystem the system is finite and uh, okay, and many other experimental um, uh, problems like the fact that the total entropy is not exactly zero because the state is not exactly pure, but it's much smaller than the than the entanglement entropy. So, and in the first approximation, can be ignored. Okay, so this was seen for some uh, small system. There was this other experiment done in Innsbruck. Uh, and here the system was much bigger. It, we are talking about of 10 or 20 qubits, as they call, which means always spin. And so the subsystem can be much larger. And you see always the same behavior that is first a linear increase followed by saturation. Obviously, these curves are less clear of the one uh, reported in numerics, even both because the system is smaller and also because it's a long range interacting system. There are uh, many, uh, many other features in the experiment that go beyond the quasi particle picture, but the qualitative behavior is exactly the same. Okay. Now, oh, oh, sorry, for, for the experiment, uh, they necessarily have to measure the Rayleigh entropy uh, density. Yes. So uh, if you were, yeah, yeah, is your statement valid for any higher order? Uh, yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. Until now, if you have here any entropy here, what change is the value of this f of p? Actually, for the Ising model, for example, in this paper in 2008, we calculated the, 
also for that case this the source term and it's it's something similar to this one okay i'm not going to write some other things that i will tell after are not valid for the rainy entropy and for interacting integrable while for three models everything is understood for the rainy entropy for interacting integrable model there are still some problem to access this source term here the equivalent of this guy yeah. that i will make i don't think i will make clear because i'm going very slowly i, I like it i'm going slowly because i'm uh, i hope i'm uh, keeping everyone uh, uh, attention but uh, okay probably i will not discuss what are the trouble with the rainy entropy but it's not fundamental okay anyhow a crucial point that i want to stress is that the let's remember where we started there is a clear connection between the entanglement entropy and uh the thermodynamic entropy the rainy entropy are uh, are not really thermodynamic so they are very good object they are measure of entanglement in uh, for uh, depending on the value of the parameter uh but uh they fail to describe the thermodynamics generically so there is the open question to find way uh, to access the entanglement entropy. this is very important it's really an open issue that uh, nowadays there is no known way to measure in an experiment or in a quantum monte carlo simulation is the same thing the uh, entanglement entropy and it will be very important to design a protocol for which this measure is really feasible, which is not quantum tomography. Obviously, I can make quantum tomography of the state, meaning I can reconstruct the state, but reconstructing the state is a procedure that is exponentially, uh, uh, exponentially expensive in the, in the system sites, like for the system that is 20, uh, the, uh, the Hilbert space will be two. It's, Due to the 20, which is obviously we can one cannot reconstruct receiving of space on the computer to put down a matrix two to 20 times two to 20 on a computer. So just it's completely undoable making quantum tomography already for this small system. Larger, it's impossible. So one can make quantum tomography for very small system, and that's all. Question before moving to the, the main question. Okay, if not, I, I move back. Now that we set the stage, I move back to the question which, which was, what is the evolution of an entanglement entropy in a, for a generic integrable model? Oops, yeah, there's a typo. Okay. Um, so in a generic integrable model there are infinite species of quasi particle that's uh, one fact which actually they can be seen as bound state of the elementary particle all this uh, quasi particle can be see should be treated independently so the time evolution of the entanglement entropy according to the quasi particle picture will be just the sum over all the species of quasi particle times the same function we wrote before okay so this integral for short time with the theta function for uh, short time and uh, the other one for the opposite theta function in the terms that multiply l multiplied by the velocity now this equation is nice we expect to describe according to the quasi particle picture the time evolution of the entanglement entropy in a generic integrable model but to make this equation predictable and predictive and testable in a numeric in a numerical experiment or even in a real experiment we should fix these guys here both the entropy density in momentum spaces and of lambda and the velocity of the quasi particle that in some cases is trivial in some cases is not so trivial also so without knowing this formula this uh, this variable this is a nice formula which tells you that the behavior is like this one linear growth followed by saturation 
but not more than that, because okay, uh, we should know what are these uh, this objects. We, and okay, we solved this problem four years ago now. And the main idea is to use the knowledge of the thermodynamic entropy in the stationary state to go back in time to get the entanglement. What I mean with this? This is our formula, okay? Our quasi-particle conjecture. We take the limit for infinite time of this formula. As I say, this theta function, the, the theta function kills this integral here, and we are left only with this guy on the entire uh, momentum region, okay? So the entanglement entropy at infinite time has just this form in which it appears only this uh, uh, entropy density in momentum space, as and a lambda, sometimes they are called source term, okay. Let, let's call entropy density in momentum space. Now, this object, this entanglement entropy is equal for time equal to infinity to the thermodynamic entropy. So if we have an expression of the thermodynamic entropy, okay, with capital L system size replacing small l here, written in terms of the quasi, in terms of integral of quasi momentum of entangling quasi particle, then we can reconstruct who is SN of lambda, take this SN of lambda, put in this equation, and have a formula for the entanglement entropy. Is the logic clear? If not, and if yes, let's apply to an elementary example to make clear, which is free fermion. Okay? What it means for me, free fermion? Free fermion means that the, it exists a basis in which the Hamiltonian can be written as sum of some energy mode times number operator of that uh, mode, which means B dagger K, B K, where B, uh, K, B dagger K are the creation and annihilation operator of the fermion. Okay, so this is the definition of free fermion. It's a quadratic uh, form in, big, uh, in some basis. Now, what is in, in any statistical ensemble rotate D, what is the thermodynamic entropy of prefermion? Thermodynamic entropy is just given by the formula that I write down here, in which H of NK is minus N log N, minus one minus N log one minus N. Here, NK, is the mode occupation of the mode K, okay? And this entropy term just tells me that each mode is occupied with probability N of K, probability of finding the particle of momentum K, and is empty with probability one minus N of K, okay? So the, this is basic statistical mechanics, this course one for fermion, okay? Everyone is, is wide even in higher dimension just uh, integral is multidimensional and here there is the volume, okay? So this formula just tells me what I just said, that N of K is the probability of finding uh, a particle of momentum K. But what is N of K? N of K is the expectation of value of B dagger K, B K, okay? But B dagger K, B K is conserved because it commutes with Hamiltonian for each K by definition. It's just this object is diagonal in the same object, okay? So the value of B dagger K, B K in the uh, thermodynamic ensemble, actually we don't have even to calculate, since it's conserved, we can just take the value that it assumes at zero time. So from the initial state, we calculate what is N K, then we plug into this formula and this is the thermodynamic entropy. Okay, so for any initial state, if we are able to diagonalize the system of free fermion, that usually we are, we know what is the thermodynamic entropy. And here we go to the, uh, to the entanglement entropy. This is exactly the form that we want to be plugged in our um, uh, formula for the entanglement entropy, okay? Which was written here. It, okay, forget about N, there is no, it's free, uh, free fermion, there is no multiple species, it's just one species. There's an integral with momentum of a source there. And that's what it is. The source term is just this function N of K, H of N of K. So the entanglement entropy, according to quasi-particle picture, will be 
given by this formula, which is exactly the same as before, but in which now f of p is given by h of n of h of n of k, which is this function here, and n of k is the population of the mode in the initial state, so everything is known, and vk is just the derivative of this energy here of the mode k, epsilon prime k. So in this formula, everything is known now. Okay. By the way, one can check what is going on. Is this formula agreeing with the results of the free fermion that I showed the year before, which in fact is known for the icing model, sorry, which in fact is known to be mapped to free fermion. If you see the formula and you stare for a very short while, yes. And in fact, because N of K, the mode occupation, uh, the equation of that mode is just given by one minus cos delta k divided by two, and the two formula perfectly match. Okay, but as you see from this quasi-particle picture and the identification of the entanglement entropy with the thermodynamic entropy, we got this result in one slide. Okay, here I, in this slide where there are very few formulas, even there are all the elements to write down this formula. I didn't skip any part of the of the calculation, so it's really elementary. In comparison, the calculation, the ab initio calculation I did long ago with Maurizio is extremely long and takes many, many pages because it really constructs the entanglement entropy at any time. Okay, so uh, one can really get a final formula in a very uh, simple way. Okay, there are other questions? So you compare the uh, formula for SA on this slide with the previous um, result, and this uh, shows the, the, the match. And which, uh, okay. Yeah, obviously, the only match is H of N of K. VK was obviously in both cases what it is. What we calculated without calculating is this N H and of K in the sense we just got from the question from the identification of entropy thermodynamic and entanglement entropy so without making calculation we just say this should be we get and then we compare with the uh, with what we got from an actual calculation which is much more complicated and we get exactly the same so this is a, a, a exact uh, is it always a exact or all were there some approximations at some point uh... Or, or the quasi particle. Um, the quasi particle picture it's wide as long as T and L are large enough. Okay. But because there is this, it's clear even if you think also to uh, I don't know a model on the a model on the lattice, a quasi particle exists if the quasi particle travels several lattice sites. Else you cannot take a trajectory on uh, on a space where there is nothing. Okay, so. It, there is a continuum limit involved in this, okay? Obviously, so you need, it's exact, but as long as T and L are large. Then large means even not too large, but okay, this is, you will see some, some comparison soon for complicated cases. No, but just to give a flavor of, uh, I can write in, okay, uh, we wrote the same formula for boson. Okay, the only change is h of n of k is another function. Okay, there is a plus here actually. It's a plus here and here. This is the, the formula for boson, which uh, one gets exactly in the same way. But for boson, there is still not a way to obtain this formula ab initio from the definition of an entanglement entropy. So the only way to get this formula, which describes perfectly any quench for boson, is uh, for free boson, is to use the quasi-particle pitch. So it would be very nice to, <laughs> to have an ab initial calculation, but in that case, the, the reason is that the, the reduced density metric is uh, Gaussian state, but it's a symplectic structure, and it's more complicated, and there are no known techniques to me at least, but to many other people to compute this, the determinant of this kind of matrices. So it's uh, it's still an open problem to 
prove that formula from a mathematical point of view. Obviously, we all believe in quasi-particle pictures, so it's enough, and the, the numerical test is uh, very satisfactory. But the, 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 it's not rigorous mathematically. More question? Okay, if not in the remaining part of the talk, let's get a bit technical, not much, I will just be, but I need to talk about better answers if I want to explain what are these objects in generic circumstances. I don't know how many of you are familiar with better answers, probably not many, but okay, you don't need to know much about better answers. And okay, better answers, usually people are scared about it, but uh, you see, there is this famous blackboard of Feynman. I don't know if you ever saw this blackboard. It was the last blackboard that Feynman ever wrote, where there was this uh, very famous sentence that is to uh, what I cannot create, I don't understand. But on the side, there was this, uh, this other sentence that I have no clue why he was writing it down, but he wrote that one of his wish was to learn better answers problem. Okay, so Feynman at that time uh, wanted to learn better answers. I think it's a good reason for each of us to learn a bit of better answers. And there where we start now. Okay, so what we need to know about better answers, but very little stuff, so don't get scared. What we need to know is that an eigenstate of an interacting integrable model in the thermodynamic limit is characterized by something that is called TBA data. TBA data are two functions. Okay, one is called the particle density. So there is one function for each species of quasi-particle n. This index n, it counts the quasi-particles, one, two, three, four, depends on which quasi-particle we are considering. P stands for particle, and then depends on the momentum of the quasi-particle, usually called rapidity. And this particle density is exactly the particle, the mode of occupation of free fermion. So what for free fermion we are calling NK, except some normalization of Q pi that is used in better answers. But this particle density is the occupation of uh, a particle of species N with momentum lambda or K, okay? So this is exactly the same object. Then in interacting integrable mobile, there, is, there are also the old density that are denoted by rho and all h here. What is this guy? For free fermion, uh, yes. Why, why do we have this factor of uh, one by two pi? Uh, it's standard notation of better answers that I really don't like. Okay. Standard okay. since the 70s and no one is correctly allowed to touch it because <laughs> health formula will just get messy. Right. It was introduced to make some easy connection with some field theory, but now it's really redundant. Nowadays, I would say it's really not practical. Okay, but okay, fine. <laughs> it's right. right. Uh, we keep it because okay, there are very complicated formula written with this notation, and we don't want to rewrite all of that. Uh, but what is the old density? For free fermion, the old density is just one minus nk. So the probability of not finding a particle is an all. But because for, for free particle, if you have a particle or you don't have, nothing change, that mode, the Hamiltonian is diagonal in the mode and the fact that you populate one mode doesn't change what happened to the other mode. If the model is interacting instead, by definition of interaction, if a put or not a particle, it affects what happen close by, okay? So this all density is not just one minus particle density, but it's a co they are uh, related in a very complicated manner, which is the thermodynamic limit of the Bet equation, which, is, which are the, the equation of the quantization uh, of this interacting integrable model, okay? So there are some complicated integral equation that are called the Bet equation that relate these two guys. So, so it's not just one minus the other. It's something complicated. Okay. But okay, I think the the only point to understand is the origin of this guy is that the fact that the, since the particle interact, adding or removing particle change 
what happened also in the other momentum and is not left just unchanged by the S for free system. Okay. Then for convention, this is one defined also the total density at the moment lambda, which is the sum of the two. Okay, this is not an independent quantity, quantity is just a sum, which for free fermion will be one, but in this case it's different from one, and it's uh, it makes introducing it makes some formula shorter as the one that I'm writing down here, which is the only one that we need. Now the concept is that each set of this function, rho particle and rho, define a single macro state. Exactly like NK define a macro state for uh, uh, free fermion. And, but to this macro state correspond many different <coughs> microscopical states in a generalized microcanonical sense. In the sense, these are actually all the states that, are, that have the same value, not only of the Hamiltonian, but also of the other integral of motion the local one. And by the way, according to this, following this idea is the right way to prove that uh, only the local internal motion matter. But okay, this is uh, diff it's just a parenthesis. Now, for each of these macro state, the thermodynamic entropy can be calculated and was calculated by Yang Yang uh, in the 70s. And nowadays is known as Yang Yang entropy, which has is this formula here. Now, deriving this formula is just a combinatorial exercise. One just say, how many possibility I have to distribute particle here and here, counting that in total there are uh, so many, uh, uh, so many available uh, position, which is uh, rho total, okay? So it's just a combinatorial exercise that probably some of you have done in different contexts, but instead of, showing where it comes from. I want to show the, simi the, uh, the similarity with the free fermion case. Here, rho particle, log rho particle is just n of k log n of k that was appearing in my formula for the free fermion. This rho o is just one minus n of k log of one minus n of k. And the only new term is this guy here, which counts the available number of uh, uh, slots for a given momentum, which is not one as before. And so was just giving zero because log one is zero, uh, but it's, it's different from zero. And now it should be taken into account. But so the, the origin of this formula is very similar to the one before, just that should, one should take into account the total number of uh, slots available. And it's really an easy combinatorial exercise to calculate this entropy, okay? But now the Yang-Yang entropy is exactly the right form that we want to make, um, it's exactly the right form we want to be plugged in the quasi-particle picture because it's an integral over lambda of the, of the density of the quasi-particle. Okay, so this is exactly what we want. But, now there is the question, can we calculate after a quench these three objects here, this two because one is independent, so rho particle and rho after a quench in an integrable model? For the free fermion, one can just calculate n of k in the initial state and that was all. Is there an analogous way for, uh, for interacting integrable model where things are much more complicated? To make a long story very short, there was this, uh, uh, method that is called quench action approach, which was introduced a uh, few years before our ideas by uh, Jean Sebastian Coe and Fabian Esler. And, okay, to make the story short, this method give a way, which means pre uh, provide a set of nonlinear integral equation, which should be solved in order to derive exactly this rho particle and rho. Okay, so this is the story. For a given set of initial state, which are compatible with integrability. That's what this method gives. Okay, so the question is, you give me an initial state. First check is, is it compatible with integrability? If yes, then we use this method to calculate rho particle and rho, and then we plug into this formula. 
Is it clear the logic, even if it's not clear how to do it? Yes, that's fine. I, I guess so. And then I continue. But if you have questions, just to interrupt at any moment again. So we assume now, so this is a big conjecture now. We assume that the bad excitation are the quasi particles that enter in our quasi particle formula, which is quasi reasonable. And so the conjecture for the time evolution of the entanglement entropy is this guy here, with, where SN of lambda is the young young entropy. And I should, I should still tell you who is the velocity of the quasi particle. This is another thing that is complicated because the velocity of the quasi particle in interacting integrable model depends on the state. In jargon, we say that there is a dressing of the bare velocity due to interaction. But as I understand in this audience, there are many field theories and this should not be a surprise at all. Okay, it's the same phenomenon that brings the velocity of the light to be different in a medium and in the vacuum. Why? The velocity of the light is different in a medium because the interaction of the light uh, with the medium dress the velocity and gives a different value. Okay, in this case, is the interaction of the particle with themselves that the dresses the, the velocity, but still the phenomenon is really the same. Okay, so what we say here is that we conjecture that in this formula we should plug the group velocity of excitation build on top of the stationary state that is the one entering in this formula. This is a quite reasonable assumption, which has been in fact uh, put forward in also in other circumstances, like for the light cone spreading of correlation by Bon, Esles and Lockley. And it's also the crucial assumption that enters in some other idea that is called the so-called generalized autodynamics that was put forward uh, more or less at the same time as our paper, so probably a few, uh, one month after, if I remember correctly, but more or less at the same time. And also the, the, the basic assumption in that paper is also the same, that the velocity of the quasi-particle that enters in this dynamic is the one on top of the stationary state. If you know what I'm talking, else just, uh, these are just two arguments to say that this is not a surprise. Everyone would have, uh, uh, would have plugged that velocity in this formula, even if for the non-expert of integrability can sound not obvious. What was really not obvious is how to identify this as of lambda that I just showed. Okay? And this velocity can be calculated again our solution of some integral equation that it's rather standard how to do it in integrable models, so I don't want to enter how to do it. Now, so this is a conjecture, as I said. There are so many assumptions that uh, cannot be called a derivation, but a conjecture. We should test numerically. Okay, so what we did, we consider the so-called XXZ spin chain, which is an anisotropic Heisenberg chain, which is the paradigm of all the interacting model. And we calculated the time evolution of the entanglement entropy in this model after some quench uh, with an algorithm that is called time dependent density matrix normalization group. For the expert, they know I don't have to tell anything. For the non expert, just ignore. We have some model which is integrable and we can compute for finite uh, subsystem. The, we can exactly compute the dynamic with some numerical method. That's what you should uh, know. So we compute this uh, time evolution and what we get are the curves that are depicted here, which are the raw, data, the raw data. As you see, this is a subsystem of dimension two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's very small because that's what we can do with the time dependent DMRG. And you see the behavior that is a linear increase followed by a slow saturation. Okay, so as first check, we took the value at uh, the largest available time, and we plot against the subsystem time to check if they are linear and extensive as expected. There is a quite clear extensive uh, behavior, which is uh, corroborating that we are doing the right stuff. Okay, now we should take this formula, take the entropy divided by L, and plot against time divided by L, so that 
should the the prediction of the quasi particle picture will be this red card here. As you see, here are the data from 5 to 20. There is quite a lot of fine size scaling. These curves are slowly getting towards our results. How we can uh, uh, argue if uh, our results are correct or not, we can extrapolate this data, okay, with a proper fit in one over L to infinite L. And if we make this extrapolation, we get the card that is here. That, as you see, for uh, all the time where we have enough data, fall perfectly on our cards. Okay, this is, I would say, it's rather satisfactory already at this level because we are talking about very small system. We are able to extrapolate and to make some. Uh, some reasonable agreement between our conjecture and uh, uh, the data, but we can do even better. We can use for the same model, another algorithm that is called ITBD, which means um, uh, infinite time evolved block decimation. Why? For the expert, they know what it is. For all the other, it's just another algorithm. The important, the nice thing of this algorithm, it, has, it allows to work directly with the infinite system, okay? Exactly, you have infinite system and you can work with infinite system, no finite size, to the price that you can easily calculate the half chain entanglement. So the entanglement of our system. But if we take our, our formula here, the, uh, the half chain entanglement entropy, it's basically the case that L is equal to infinity. This term is not there, there is only this term here. And so the slope, of the entanglement entropy is given by the formula that is written here. S prime of t should be equal to this form. Okay? So just by the quasi particle ratio. And this is the regime in which uh, the quasi particle feature has more difficulty to arrive because it's. Uh, it obviously reproduces the right result at infinite time because even if everything was wrong, we con by construction we oblige the entanglement entropy to be the thermodynamic entropy, which is true. So this should work uh, by definition. So as the time gets smaller, more difficult is that uh, more difficult, more likely is that there is if there is some error in the quasi particle picture will be detected. Let's put it like that. And in fact, there is no error because we plot in this uh, figure here the slope of the entanglement entropy for many different quenches with many initial states, many final Hamiltonian. Now, these are just names that to the, if there are uh, uh, experts in the field know what it means, this initial state and know what does it mean, this final Hamiltonian, but this, doesn't matter. The, the main idea that I want to pass is that we consider many initial states compatible with integrability and many final Hamiltonian within this, uh, uh, this model. And for all the cases, okay, these are, uh, we see that the entanglement entropy, the slope of the entanglement entropy, this is the slope, so it's the derivative already, after some uh, short transient time, get Exact, I would say exactly, or ex at least very, very closely to the value that has been predicted by better answers, okay? Within our conjecture. We see in all the cases here, and these are not just some uh, properly chosen, are, they span uh, many or the many uh, window of initial and final, initial state and final Hamiltonian. And, it's even not that they are very close value. The slope of the entanglement entropy here can vary between zero and log two. That's basically uh, what it can do. And you see that in this picture, we almost span completely this window. Log two is 0 0.7 more or less. So you see that we arrive to very close values. Okay, so it's not just a coincidence that, okay, this, this object has a very small variation. No, this object, we are taking all the, vari all the possible variation of the, the slope and we find in all the cases uh, extremely good agreement. So from this, I will conclude that uh, our conjecture works 
very well, at least for this model. And these are the data that we reported in our original paper in 2016. After our work, we, me and some other collaborators, but as well as other people, made many other tests of this conjecture on, with different uh, variation of what is going on here. And the, uh, the conjecture resisted all possible tests that have been done until now. So it's really robust and it's, um, I'm very confident that it's correct. Okay, so what time it is now? Oof, it's very late, so I think I will stop with this uh, formula and I will not move to the, to the more uh, extravagant and complicated things. And my conclusion, my first set of conclusions is that, uh, okay, this is our conjecture for the time evolution of uh, the entanglement entropy and integrable model. First thing, it's a conjecture. It would be nice since things, the model is integrable and we are able to make many calculations to find a proof. Maybe without knowing the result, it would have been really impossible to find this formula, but now that we know what we want to prove, maybe there is a way to prove it, okay? This is an open issue that is, I found very interesting. The nice thing is that it's valid for an arbitrary integrable model. You know, they change, uh, the, this object change, but the formula is just the same. And another thing that I really appreciate of this formula is that shows in a very elegant manner, the crossover from the entanglement entropy, okay, to thermodynamic entropy. It shows how the entanglement grows ballistically and arrive to the thermodynamic value all in one formula without any things extremely complicated. Okay? It's just a, a very simple physical behavior that we can understand with the quasi-particle picture. And this is very remarkable. Okay, then actually I will stop here because I'm... Okay, I think yeah, I'm the tired, name of the you are tired. And uh, I will just, I will just say, no, no, just let me say that there have been many, many generalizations of these ideas to different situations, which, for example, include uh, different multiples of quasi-particles. We have not pairs, but triplets, quadruplets, etc. Many studies concern the Rainy entropy, which has been asked by one of you before. The transport, okay, how this quasi-particle picture and transport uh, go together when the initial state is not translational invariance. And another thing that have been asked also, what happens if you break integrability, if you give a finite uh, uh, lifetime to the particle, how to treat this object? This has also been studied, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. There has been so much work on this subject that, that would be really impossible to tell in even in a complete course. Okay, so I will stop here and I open the stage for more discussion, question, question. Yeah, in the name of the Anton, let me thank Pascal so much for a nice lecture. So, uh, some <laughs> nine uh, applause we can can give. So, yeah, we have already had uh, questions, but uh, maybe uh, yeah, we can still have some more questions, and maybe I, I actually can start. So, on the on the last slide, um, I guess this was also for the uh, ITBD uh, for the icing model using ITBD. Um, so you always uh, assumed integrability, but in the icing model, which uh, I guess for the, which this was done, there is for also like this E8 regime, mm -hmm. um, where you uh, have integrability, uh, but also have something like uh, stable meson states. So I'm wondering, uh, under such uh, conditions, do you still claim that your formula is valid? Okay, so first of all, this was the Eisenberg model, not the Isaac model, exactly, it's another one, but still, uh, the, for the Isaac model, it, now we should be careful. For the quantum field theory of the Isaac model, where there are the yet uh, theory of Zamologikov, yes, this formula should be valid. That's, uh, and there have been some, uh, Obviously, on top of this, there are some oscillations due to the mass, but then it, uh, in the scaling limit, 
but the oscillation you see even here is not at the, in the scaling limit uh, uh, we should get to this formula uh, for the theory, but wait, the Ising model on the lattice is not integrable. Only its continuum limit is integrable. So there should be done a proper scaling limit uh, to the continuum limit in order to check this formula. And okay, there, there, is, there are some work recently by Castro Alvarado, Vitti, I don't remember all the author where they were discussing some, but they were more focusing on the short time regime with oscillation than on the on this one. I expect in the, hello? Yes. Yeah, because it appeared a message, your internet connection is unstable, which is the first time, yeah. <laughs> but okay. So the, the, the answer is yes. I would expect even in the field theory of the asking model. Okay, are there other questions? Well, then actually, let me add one more question. So the protocol you described, you start at a pure state, uh, perform a quench uh, and uh, look um, at the time evolution of the entanglement entropies. If we imagine that we already start at a thermal state, so a mixed state, and perform a similar quench protocol, what fundamental differences would you expect? Um, uh, yeah, you have actually the, uh, we wrote up we wrote a paper where we discussed this issue with uh, Bruno Bertini, Lorenzo Piroli, and uh, Maurizio Fagotti, and it's quite easy to work out quantitative thing with, within free theory, then the generalization to interacting at some technical challenges, but it's practically, physically is the same story. Okay, yes, you should uh, disentangle, let me use the word, the, the mixedness on the initial state from the evolution of the entanglement. And this you can do, okay? But there are two terms basically, one that stay constant and one that evolves in this way. And you should separate the two and you can do it uh, quite easily. But the point is, okay, exactly. There is a, uh, an entropy due to the mixedness of the initial state, okay, which you, can, you should work with. And on top of this, there is a growth of entanglement, uh, which is similar to the, to the formula that I, I, I showed here. Obviously, the difficult bit is to identify this object when you want to say that the, the entanglement entropy is the entropy in the final state, but in this case, to, to the, at infinite time, you have contribution of both guys, so you should uh, uh, find a way to distinguish them, but you can do it. And uh, okay, we did in this paper of a couple of years ago. So, so in general, it's also a linear dependence. Or? Yes, it's always a linear dependence. Uh, the, the, the the final result is very similar to this one, just with a shift. The point is how to get uh, the for the right formula without solving the dynamics, just by. Uh, knowing what you are doing. By knowing initial and final state, how you can get the right source term to put here. And okay, this has been done. But the, the result yes, at qualitative level, what happens is exactly this, that there is a growth followed by saturation starting from a value that is non-zero. Non okay, thank you. Um, are there further questions? No, then uh, let's thank Pascal again. Thank you yeah. for the invitation. Thank you, Pascal.